Okay, uh, hi everyone. So we are uh, now left with actually two lectures this week and next week, and we will be done with the course. Now, what we covered so far, we talked about starting from the high voltage uh, generation, measurement, testing, testing at the lab, testing uh, at the sites, condition monitoring. Then we talked about uh, outdoor insulation uh, with some emphasis on uh, the condition monitoring and application machine learning. Now, one important question is that why we are testing the equipment at high voltages in the in our labs. For example, the transformer, we test it at high voltage AC and high voltage lightning impulse and high voltage switching impulse. What, what is the reason uh, if the transformer will be connected to 11 kilovolt or 13.8 kilovolt? Why I have to test it at 38 kilovolt AC and 95 kilovolt impulse? What was the reason for that? So we will try to answer this question in this lecture and in the next lecture, which is what are the sources of over voltages in the power system? So when we have the, uh, the equipment there, why we will have, what are the sources that we will have sort of uh, over voltages in the, in the power system? So today is part one, next week will be part two. So I would like to look, look to this, to these two lectures is the connection between high voltage engineering and the power system, because th those uh, th those over voltages are due to some operations in the power system. So if even if you are a high voltage engineer who work in insulation, it's very important to understand the link between the two. What is the impact, for example, if you have a switching uh, happen in the system or there is a lightning happen in the system, how this will generate, will contribute to the production or to the generation of high voltages that can impact your equipment. So we'll start with some background. As we know that most of the, especially the transmission system is basically formed from overhead lines. Overhead lines is the main form of transmitting the power from the generations to the load. And we have, especially in North America, all or most of the substations are outdoor substations as well. Hence, since these are uh, outdoor uh, uh, assets, they are subjected to lightning strikes. Also, we have different forms of switching that happens in the in the power system, which will also will introduce high voltage uh, high voltages as well. Okay. Now, when basically a disturbance happened through uh, or from an, a lightning event or from a switching event, this will lead to a sort of an over voltage or an, an over current at that specific point. It's not that only problem happened at that specific point, but these surges will propagate in the system. Okay until it reaches to a termination, like for example, a substation. And we will see as the, uh, those surges travels in the transmission uh, lines, what will, what will happen. Now, those waves, they might be uh, reflected back, transmitted, attenuated, distorted during the operation until the energy is completely, completely uh, absorbed. So, Traveling waves, the theory of traveling wave, it's a, by itself is a huge concept. And we cover that part of another course called power system transients. But I thought I will borrow part of the material that is relevant to the high voltage uh, applications and present it here. So what I'm presenting is a very short uh, part of this important concept. So let's us try to understand the traveling wave concept on a transmission line. What, what do we mean by this? So let's look here, uh, uh, and this is a very, the hydraulic analogy is very, very uh, relevant. Now let's see the, imagine here you have this uh, dry channel and you have here a gate and the water is on this side. So this side has water in it and this side is basically uh, dry, okay? Now, when you lift the gate, when once you open,
open the gate, what will happen? The water would start to flow, but the flow doesn't happen immediately. It will take some time, okay, until this channel is completely filled with, uh, with water. So you can see that the water is basically propagating. Okay? So at any instance of time, the channel ahead of the wave is dry while behind is filled with, uh, with water. And this is true regardless what is what was at the end here. If there is a hole, if there is a reservoir, if whatever, the ending here until the water reaches there will not impact the flow of the water. So this is how we look to the traveling waves as we will explain here now. So now let's assume that we have a, a transmission system and it's modeled as an LC circuit. So the R is not considered here. The R basically is the attenuation factor or the uh, resistance. So the, when the switch is open, okay, there's no surge there. These inductors and capacitors, they are not charged yet, okay? Okay, so here when we close the switch, this voltage would not appear at the end of the line immediately. It will take some time for this wave to travel from the source until it reaches to the to the end. Okay. Now, we assume, as I said, the line is lossless, means R equal to zero. Now, when we discuss this, this concept in details, we consider also the losses, which will complicate the analysis. But as I said, for this course, we just want to have the feeling of the traveling wave theory and how this can impact our uh, switching and lightning uh, events. Now, when you close the switch, the moment you close the switch, the inductor will be an open circuit, the capacitor will be short circuit, but this inductor and that capacitor, the moment you close any uh, switch for a capacitor, it changes to basically a short circuit immediately until it's charged. Now, when this is, C1 is a charge, it moves from short circuit to an open circuit, and the inductor, the opposite, it moves from the open circuit to the short circuit. So eventually when these two are charged, this will be a short circuit and this will be an open circuit. So the, the surge now will move to L2C2. It does the same thing. Start an open circuit and short circuit. It start as an open L2C2 as a short circuit. Then eventually this becomes a short circuit and this becomes an open circuit. And it keep on propagating until it reaches the, the end. So this is how the waves, if we have a wave at the beginning of the line, how it will start to uh, propagate, but it will propagate. And that is something very important because when you talk about the transients, it's very important to realize that those waves propagate with time and they are not, they are not stationary. And that will lead us to something very, very important. Now, when you have these surges happen at a point of certain point in the transmission line, it doesn't mean it will stay there, or it doesn't mean if it doesn't impact the system at that point, it will not impact the system a few kilometers from there. It, it might, as the wave propagates, if there's a weak point, weak insulation, it might affect that insulation because they propagate with, with time. Okay, so let's see. We'll just pick one example. Now we have here a junction between two different, uh, I would say, structure, and I will give some examples for this. Now these two structures are basically each one has a different characteristic or surge impedance Z. And for a lossless line, this is for your information. We'll talk about that in details. The Z is equal to root L over C. This is called the surge or the characteristic impedance. So this is the characteristic impedance when it is generic. We use surge impedance when the system is lossless. Okay. So Z is equal to root L over C. L and C you have them here in the in the system. Now this could be, for example, you have a sending end where you have your uh, basically your uh, surge going. Now Z A could be, for example, a transmission line, and Z B could an underground cable. So there is a junction, which is the cable terminations or the cable joint between 
the overhead lines and the underground cable uh, determination actually okay uh, this could be a transmission line and this could be a substation okay and this is the again the junction or the uh, termination between the overhead lines and the substations so basically you could have different systems so each one will have its own uh, surge or characteristic impedance now suppose now that the voltage surge now we have a voltage surge this could be like a lightning let's say or a switching event that happens somewhere in the overhead lines and it has a magnitude of v1 so we want to see what will happen to this v1 this v1 now is approaching this junction now, as we have a voltage wave formed here, okay, then we'll have a current I1. So V1 divided by the characteristic impedance of the overhead lines will give me the, the surge currents. Okay. Now, when the voltage wave form and the current reaches here, part of it will be reflected, part of it will be transmitted. And what we want to see here, we have when we have this junction. How much of this voltage will make it to the other side, and how much of it will be reflected back? Okay. So I two because it is uh, basically going back. This is your V two part of it divided by Z A, and we have the negative sign because it's the opposite direction. And V three uh, I three is equal to V three divided by Z. Okay. So the voltages before and uh, these are waves. So V one plus V two equal to V three. KCL basically, I1 plus I2 is equal to I, I3. So these are surges, voltage surge, and a current surge. Now, you can substitute here I1 and I2 and I3 with its values. So we have here I1 equal to V1 over ZA, I2 minus V2 over ZA, and so on and so forth. So when you do that, substitute for the currents, we'll get this relationship. So now here I'm substituting the values of I1, I2, and I3 here. Now I want to eliminate v3 so you have this as v1 plus v2 so eliminate v3 and have this as v1 plus v3 collect the terms you will find that v2 the reflected wave is equal to zb the surge impedance of let's say maybe this is an underground cable minus the za of the overhead lines divided by their summation and this is something very very interesting because if the surge impedance of ZB is lower than ZA, then you will have a negative voltage. And this is very important. Why is that? Because let's say you have V1 coming with a positive polarity. We have a reflected wave will be added to it. So this is happening in a very short period of time. So if this is negative, then it will reduce basically the wave that's coming and reach to the joint. But if ZB is more than ZA, then the reflected wave will be positive and will be added to V1, which will make things worse. And we'll talk about the impact of this when we we'll talk about lightning and overhead lines. This is formula, keep this in mind. We'll talk about this. So this ZB minus ZA over ZB plus ZA is called the reflection coefficients. This is what will decide how much of the wave will be reflected back. Now, how much is transmitted? We can just only substitute, eliminate V2 now, do the same thing. You will get that V3 equal to this. And we can notice that the transmitted wave will be always at the same, at the same uh, sign as V1. It will be part of V1, will be transmitted. Now, it depends on ZB and ZA values. This will decide how much of this wave originally will be going to that second the second system, which is ZB in this case. And this is called the refraction uh, coefficient. Now, let's see this simple example. So we have here an overhead line, transmission line. The surge impedance is 400 ohm. Again, Z is nothing but root L over, over C. It's connected to an underground cable with a surge impedance. So this is of the overhead lines, ZB, which is equal to 50 ohm. So this is equal to 400 ohm. And these are basically typical values. The, the surge impedance of the underground cable is less than the surge impedance of the, of the overhead lines all the time. And you see this configuration a lot. Uh, for example, in distribution system, you see that inside the city, you see an overhead lines, 
And then if you have a transformer uh, pad mounted, there will be a cable coming from the overhead lines to the underground cable. So that is basically the termination. Here, this is the junction. And this junction would be basically, uh, would be the weakest point. And uh, for a couple of reasons, one of them is because this junction or this cable termination or uh, is done uh, in the field, not in the factory. So it is prone to a lot of defects, especially uh, because of the envir environment, because of the how skill is your worker. So, uh, and also because of the surge that happens at this junction point. As we will, uh, as we will see. Uh, so usually, when there is a, a fault happening in underground cables, this is one of the weakest points. So we want to see different things here. Now we have a surge of voltage, 300 kilovolt, strikes the overhead lines at the beginning. Find the following different things. So the reflected surge is equal to this. Okay, this is how much is reflected back. Okay. Now we have ZB is less than ZA. So the reflecting back will be negative, which is a good thing because now it will be actually reducing the incident wave. So just substitute 50 minus 40, 50 plus 40 times 300, so you get minus 233 kilovolt. That is how much reflected back. The transmitted surge is basically V3 times 2ZB over, this is the refractive coefficient, and you will find that this is equal to 66.7, so 300 kilovolt. Hit the line, minus 233 going back, 66.7 will, will make it to the other, other side. The traveling surge current, you divide the, this is how much, this is V1 and this is ZA. So this is how much current is traveling, okay? And this is how much current is basically uh, reflected. And this is how much current is basically making it to the other side. So we have very high surge surge current okay so with this understanding this is very important fundamental understanding that when you have a wave or a surge that hits the line at certain location it will propagate okay and when it sees a discontinuity or a junction Part of it will be reflected back, what part of it could be uh, actually transmitted. Okay, so keep this in mind that behavior of those surges when they happen in the system. Now, what are the sources of the over voltage that we'll talk about in this class? We'll talk about lightning a little bit, physics of lightning, uh, how uh, when it hits the line, how much over voltage we have there coming of it, what is the impact of the uh, foot resistance of the towers on uh, on the surge uh, reflection reflections. So talk about that. Then also today we'll talk about normal switching events. And these normal uh, switching events, the first one we'll talk about capacitor in rush current. What will happen when I switch on a capacitor? As we know, capacitors are very important to the power system. We need them to basically uh, improve the power factor. But once I connect to those capacitors, there is basically a surge that happens that I have to be aware of. So that is, we'll talk about that in details. And then we'll talk about the TRV or the transient recovery voltage. TRV is a well-known term used in the literature. So the transient recovery voltage, when there is a fault happening in the system and my breaker try to interrupt this current, open the breaker, there will be a very high voltage appears with a high frequency at the terminal of the breaker, breaker before it clears the fault. And we'll see what is the impact if it doesn't clear the fault, when this happens. Uh, so all these things we'll talk about them. So this is what we'll be covering today. Next week, we'll talk about something called abnormal switching events. These are two normal switches. Connect the capacitor bank, this is very normal. Uh, clearing a fault, from a breaker, this is also normal. But there is some abnormal, like what we call current chopping. We'll, we'll talk about that. Disconnecting a capacitor bank, we'll see the impact of this. Ferro resonance is a very important phenomenon that happens, especially in the distribution system, and it's impact. Now, these we'll talk about them next week. Plus, we'll talk about also how we can protect the power system from surges. Okay. Now, there are two different things here when it comes to protection of the power system assets. 
One thing is that from the manufacturer, the manufacturer should design basically the asset to withstand certain high voltages. Okay, so that's from the perspective of the uh, perspective of the uh, uh, the manufacturer, but also the utility. They have to ensure that the sales voltages does not exceed what the manufacturer is trying to supply you with. For example, if I supply you a transformer, we call the transformer can withstand 95 kV surge, lightning surge. Okay, so the manufacturer should design a transformer that will be able to withstand this. However, the utility, they basically, they have another obligation, which is to make sure that no sales more than 95 kV will make it to the transformer. So we have to provide certain protection mechanism to ensure that. Also, this will be covered next, next week. So let's talk about lightning. Let's talk about a little bit of the physics of the lightning. So when we have a, a cloud, a thunder cloud, and it's about it's charged electrically. So now these are the negative charge. So negative charge means that the atoms are basically are absorbing electrons. So they are heavier and those are losing electrons. Okay. So the heavy part or the heavy electrons basically will come down and the positive will, will go up. So you creating here a, an electric field within the, the cloud. Okay. But also uh, this is something uh, very, uh, I mean, this is always the case. Yes. At the bottom part, they are negatively charged. The, the top part is positively charged, but the overall is neutral because the number of positive and negative are exactly uh, the same. Okay, so this and the, the bottom of your uh, cloud and the ground, you will act like a huge capacitor. Okay, and the dielectric media between the two is air. So this is negative charge. And the ground will be uh, by induction will be positive charge actually. Okay, so because this is negative, okay. So once this is negative, then this will be uh, uh, induced uh, both because the negative here will uh, rebel with the negative charges here. So this the the ground beneath this cloud will be positive positive charge. Now the breakdown of air is ideally at 30 kV uh, per centimeter peak. Okay. Now remember, this is a surge. So here we don't, we don't talk about RMS. RMS is only for AC, a sinusoidal. For AC, the breakdown of air is 22 kilovolt uh, per centimeter. But this is, we talk about only the peak value, which is 30 kilovolt per, per centimeter. However, because of the humidity, but now remember, this is a cloud, so the weather isn't humid. And because of the high attitude, then the uh, breakdown voltage, now we have high, we have a low pressure. When you have a low pressure, you have a lower breakdown voltages. And just as a side note, this is one of the challenges for designing uh, an electrification system for airplanes, uh, because the material, the insulation material, the breakdown, we always work underground level. But once you go in high attitude, then this will be changing because of the low pressure. So here the required field to create a breakdown is not 30 kV anymore. It is around 10 kilovolt per centimeter. Now let's see what will happen. We'll start from here. When the field reaches this, this value, the air around the cloud will be ionized. Ionization is the process that of changing a dielectric air, the gas, into basically a conductor. Why? Because now this air, which is neutral, you are stripping away the electrons, so you will have positive and negative charges. So now you have what we call the plasma or ionization around the cloud. Now, once you start to have ionizations, then a streamer, a little bit of charge will start to come from the cloud, from the tip of the cloud, and move a little bit in, in the front. Which, as you can see here, with the, this, these are basically our negative charges. Now, depends on how strong is the ionization. If this is very strong, then this small branch will evolve to this, will start to 
branch out. And sometimes you can see it in the sky. You start to see it there. Sometimes there's no thunderstorm yet, but you can see sort of those uh, streamers. Uh, and, and we call uh, in uh, insulation material, we call them stepped leader. So basically you have one leader and then start to uh, establish and then goes further and further and start to branch out. Now, uh, these leader steps are uh, in the order of around 50 meters in length. So it's very, very lengthy. Uh, and the charge brought from the cloud uh, through this ionization until it reaches the air. So it's keep on doing this, keep on branching out, moving out until, as you can see, it start to reach the, the ground. Now, when it reaches the ground here, uh, basically you comes in contact with the, uh, with uh, the ground. The ground is positively charged, remember, because of the induction. And the streamer is here, it is a negative charge. So, and, and this bath, this whole bath is completely ionized now with negative charges. Then those, now here, all these negative charges of the cloud is being now neutralized. How? Because of the positive charges now will go and will go and neutralize the, the, uh, the charges in the cloud. So basically the lightning that we see, the one that we recognize, is going from the ground to the cloud, not the other way around. The cloud, it, mo it moves the streamer, the leader steps until it reaches to the ground. Once it reaches to the ground, it strikes back with, to neutralize this, uh, this cloud. What we hear, what we see is this strike back. There are some nice videos on YouTube. You can uh, Google them. It gives this, uh, this in a very, very low motion. So that you can really see this, see this, uh, uh, this mechanism. Okay, now the degree. That, so this is the physics of the lightning. This is what is happening in the lightning. Now, lightning, when it hits, it has some devastating effect. So as power system engineer, you have to know which areas are more prone to lightning than than others. Okay, now. And we measure the lightning activity. And how we measure that? We have something called the uh, chronic level T. Okay. Now, what is this chronic level T? It's the number of days per year on which the thunder is heard at a particular location. So, how many at that specific locations? How many thunder we heard there? We, uh, we can create a map of this. So such a map uh, can come, uh, this is the map for the US. Uh, it, it looks like something like the eco-potential lines, but it's not, of course, eco-potential lines. So see here, for example, to the west of the US, this is Arizona. This is here, this is five. So along this line, this area will have five uh, days in a year where you can hear a, a, a thunder. But for example, here in Florida, and as we know, Florida is very uh, prone to lightning and floods, and it's 90. Okay, so such map is very important for you, for the those who are designing the overhead system, because when you design overhead line system for a place that is subjected to a lot of lightning, is different than when you design a system when an area like doesn't have that much of lightning. Now. How the line of fire can impact this uh, lightning, the solar structure is more likely to be struck. And this is always the case. It's not just an overhead line. Now, we, we design different overhead lines. And one of the criteria we use to decide about the length of the line is the voltage level. For example, if I design a 400 kilovolt line, it's different than if I design uh, a distribution line. So if I, I, I design a 400 or 700, it will have much, much taller tower. Now, the taller the tower, the more prone to be subjected to lightning. Uh, and this is why when you have tall structures, you have to have a special uh, protection system for the, for the lightning. Okay, so here, this is an overhead lines. We have here the shield conductor. 
Okay, so this is a typical. Uh, uh, this is a single circuit, uh, uh, and it, everything is uh, horizontal. So this is phase A, B. This is phase A, B, and C, and these are the shield conductors to protect. Uh, so your objective basically is when a lightning strike hits, it hits the, the shield conductor. Now the shield conductor, its objective is basically to take this surge to the ground, okay? Distribute it to the ground and protect your overhead lines. So the angle, this is what the angle of protection. This is, uh, here is phase A, B, and C. And this is the phase angle that protect the your line. However, now, we have something uh, called the shadow. What is the shadow here? Now, this is the whole, W is your shadow. This is all, this is the whole thing is your shadow. Now, if the, uh, your lightning will basically terminate uh, or will hit in this area, it's most likely it will terminate on the line or the supporting tower. So if a lightning will hit between this point this point, if this is the vicinity, most likely it will be hitting the structure or will be hitting the, 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 the tower. If it is outside this, most likely it will not hit the tower, but it will hit the, uh, the ground uh, or anything around, around the tower. Now, the shield here, it's there to protect the overhead lines from the, the surge that can come and hit your uh, your overhead line. Now, now here you can see that this is the B. Keep this in mind, and this is your H. Uh, B is the uh, is the distance here. This is your uh, B, which comes here between the 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 shield, the two, the distance between the two uh, ground wire or the shield wire. Now, this, as I said, this H and values of this is different from design to design. I will give some examples as we progress. Now, if we know that chronic level, how many lightning will happen in certain area per, uh, per, per year, how many, in many days, it is possible to estimate the number of flashes to any line. So the IEEE standard came up with this formula. This is a statistical formula. They said that the number of lightning flashes, a lightning that will lead to a flash over on a line per 100 kilometers per year is equal to 0 0.004 times T. T is the, uh, the uh, chronic uh, level. So the higher the chronic level, the higher the number of lightning flash, which makes sense. So if you have a place that is subjected every year to 90 or 100 uh, strikes compared to a place subject to one or two, so definitely the number of uh, uh, the uh, flashes will be higher than this. Times B plus H. B is the distance, so the bigger the distance, the more, so there will be this protection. And as the higher the H, again, H is mean that you have a much bigger area that this, the, if the lightning hits, then it will be most likely hitting the structure. So for example, here, for uh, if we have the coronic level is 30, H is 26, and B is 6.7 6 meters. Let's just to remind ourselves, what are those values? This is your B. And this is your uh, this is your t uh, this is your h. It is the h is basically your the length of your of your tower. This is your h. But this is how to decide your w, which is two h, one point oh nine plus b plus two h one to the power of one point zero nine. But h is basically the height, and it makes sense as the taller the structure, the most likely that we will have a flash over on those structures. So here you will have 57.67 per 100 kilometer per year that you might have a chance of a flash over. Okay. Now, also, the, the impact of the stroke on a line will also depend on other factors, like, for example, the current magnitude, rate of the rise, and the impedance of the stroke. So when the stroke hits, it depends on also the impedance in C, the surge impedance of the line, the surge impedance of the tower itself. Okay. So what is the probability? This is also has been calculated or estimated that what is the probability that certain stroke will exceed certain current I? 
this probability is called pi and this pi is equal to one over one plus i over 31 per, per unit okay so you have here the, the uh, drawing for this and for example here this is the probability so 50 percent probability you will have that the current value is will be exceeding 31 kilo amps 90 percent chance you will have the line will exceed the maybe 12 kilo amps and so on and so forth so this curve can give you uh, the uh, probability of that uh, what's the probability that certain surge will exceed the certain current current values okay now as we mentioned that when the lightning strike now it might go through the tower okay it might go through the tower uh, sometimes it doesn't go through the tower sometimes it goes it depends where it hits okay so if it, every tower design they will have different surge impedance so that if the line uh, if the, the uh, surge hits the tower itself okay so it will see certain surge impedance which depends on different uh, things for example here this is equal to two times h square plus r square h is the length r is the width at the, the ground level uh, this is a lattice structure this is basically a wooden pool okay and here all the dimensions so you have each design based on its dimension will have certain surge impedance so for example here for this design if you have 35 meter plus one which is this one with base equal to 12 meter very straightforward your surge impedance becomes equal to 88.1 now that is surge impedance is also very very important because the surge impedance along with the impedance of the ground this will tell you uh, for example uh, how much reflected wave will be there and if the wave will be uh, negative or it will be positive now this doesn't change the zt doesn't change because this is a characteristic of the structure itself but we'll see in a few slides that there is another issue with the grounding resistance which can change uh, start with can be very high or even if you start with a low foot resistance it can change with time as we would highlight that briefly briefly okay now if the tower tops are connected to a single ground wire so we have here a tower basically here and this tower is having only one uh, one single ground uh, wire okay and this has an impedance equal to 520 ohm so this tower has 500 and then you have here something hits now the reason we have this ground wire is basically it's the tallest point so the probability that we have a lightning strike to hit that more than the line is much higher so whenever a lightning hits especially if you come with that within the shield angle so if the lightning hits that uh, wire what will happen you will have now a total z effective which is the zt the surge impedance of the tower plus 0 0.5 0 0.5 because here uh, half of the we have the waveform will half of it will go to the right the other half will go to the left so we consider only uh, half of the uh, ground wire uh, impedances so it will be like in parallel with the zt so you will have a total z this is your total z of this is what has been seen by the surge current so when the surge current comes here it will see this z this is the uh, the impedance of the uh, what the object that has been uh, striking now z is uh, is the impedance of the lightning channel itself so you have the lightning channel basically in parallel which will be with your uh, impedance which is calculated here which is now it's the surge impedance in parallel with the, the ground or half of the ground uh, wire impedance now so z could be parallel as we have seen here in the previous or for a stroke that happens at the mid span of the ground wire not close to the 
to the tower, then Z will be just the 0.5 ground wire. We will not see at that mid span, it will not see at all the tower yet until it reaches the tower. As we agreed now, when the, when the surge hits the line, what is at the end of the line, it doesn't matter until it reaches it. So the voltage that you will have is equal to the current, the surge current, times the parallel combination of Z, which could be 0.5 uh, as we have it in this case, or it could be the tower in parallel with your, uh, with your uh, uh, ground wire. Okay, so simple calculations here. So divide by ZS both sides. So we get this formula, this is your voltage. Now, if Z is equal to 0.5, the ground wire, just replace it with this. Okay, and since basically ZS is much, much larger than Z ground wire, the impedance uh, or the surge impedance of the uh, lightning channel is larger here. So if this is larger than this, it goes to uh, basically to uh, zero. So your voltage is equal to I is times the Z ground uh, wire divided by, by two. Okay, so now the current and the voltage wave will propagate in the ground wire and down the tower if the tower is involved, okay? So first it will hit, depends where it hits. This is, of course, this is completely random. We have no control where the lightning will, uh, will hit. Okay, now these waves will encounter a discontinuity as we mentioned before. This could be adjacent tower, okay, or tower footing resistance. So you could go, the, the lightning it hits, it goes to another tower or it goes to the, to the foot resistance. And this will initiate the reflected waves as we mentioned in the, in the beginning. Now, what is the impact of this? For example, if the initial wave down the tower encounter a low footing resistance, which what we want, why we want that? Because now if ZB, which is the surge impedance or the impedance of the foot resistance, ZA is the total impedance encountered by the, uh, by the surge. So if this is higher than this, your V2 will be negative. And this will reduce basically the surge that goes through the tower, which is a good thing. If, it, if you have a bad foot resistance, this will lead now to, in, to V2 to be positive, the reflected wave. So it will be added up to the uh, strike wave and that is really uh, bad. Now, the potential difference across the suspension insulator is also of a particular concern. How is that? Let's see here, we have a lightning hits the tower, okay? So you have 22 kilo amps hits here, one kilo amp goes to the right, one kilo amp goes to the left, and 20 goes here. Okay. Uh, most of the current, and, and that's what we want actually. We want to have most of the current to be dissipated, not to be traveling. Okay. So assume that most of the current this happens, but this will lead to a problem. A problem if we have a high foot resistance, okay? So if the foot resistance is, is high, multiply the 20 times the 20 kilo amps, you get 400 kilo volt, 400 kilo volt across the insulator. And this will lead to a flash over definitely of the insulator. And this is called a back flash over. Okay. So this is why this want to have a very, very small value, one or two ohm only. So then this will be a 20 kilo volt distribution or transmission, it will be able to basically withstand such a high voltage and no flashover will, uh, will happen. So it's extremely important to, low, to lower the footing resistance uh, to avoid such, such a problem. So the problem have two sides. One side because of the reflected wave, when you have a, a high, if this is higher than the surge uh, impedance, then you will have a positive reflected wave this will be added. So it's not just the, uh, the 20 kilo amps, but you will have even more or the 400 kilo volt. Second, uh, also because of, as we have seen here, is the voltage that is basically developed. Now, remember, in all the analysis, we assume that the line is lossless. What does it mean? It means that 
if the wave propagates in the line, it will not be attenuated. It will be only reflected or refracted. But in uh, in reality, this is not the case. In reality, there is a resistance, and it will be attenuated. This is worst case scenario. As I said, there is a lot of things can be done here, but because we have only two weeks to cover this, so I will just give you the simplest cases so that you just have the feeling of this. Okay. Now the footing the resistance has two. There are two considerations. Number one. The resistivity of the earth itself. Number two, the connection, the, the roads that you are, you, uh, you are. Yes, Ahmed, go ahead, please. Is this the same idea as uh, as the design of a surge arrestor? No, the surge arrestor is totally different. Surge arrestor, we'll talk about it. This is, will be the last topic we'll cover next week. So mm. it's a nonlinear resistance. No, this is totally different. We'll talk about okay. that next week. Okay, mix it up. Thank you for clarification. So here depends on the uh, basically the uh, material of the, the the soil that we have. So for example, if you have a dry air, this is a very high resistivity. We have this is bad. Okay, so seawater on the other hand has a very low resistivity. So it depends on the. Sometimes we need to do some certain uh, uh, treatment to the soil so that we lower the the resistance. So we have to measure the soil resistance, and there are certain techniques, certain devices to uh, to do that. Uh, I believe there is a course about grounding. I think in, in our program talks about the grounding and these things in details. The other thing, the issue is the the road itself. Okay, so. If we have, we can control the resist the uh, foot resistance by increasing the number of ground uh, grounding roads, increasing the cross section area, increasing the length of the uh, grounding roads. So all of these things uh, will help basically to uh, uh, to achieve a lower footing uh, resistance. Okay, so I will take a break right now. Here, uh, this is about lightning. Uh, then after the break, we'll have like. Uh, We'll come back around five o'clock, 10 minutes. We'll talk about the symbol, the two symbol switching transients and their analysis, which is capacitor and rush current and clearing the, the fault. Okay, so in the previous example, we talked about lightning, a lightning, which is basically uh, some uh, over voltages happened. But this has nothing to do with the operation of the power system. Yes, the design of the power system may affect it, but this is something naturally. This is something we don't control. Now, what I will be talking about is the transient due to switching effects. Now, the switching will basically depend on the power system parameters, like the inductance and the capacitance of the system. So this will impact the amount of surge that we will have as we will see. So as I mentioned before, we talk about two events. We talk about capacitor and rush current. So this is under circuit closing transient. Now when I close a circuit and I close a transient, this is the example I will take here is the capacitor in rush in rush current. Okay. Now how to calculate this huge current that will by itself, or it will re re result in an over voltage. It's very, very complicated. Okay. Now we want to see, show to you a simple way to do the calculations to have some idea about it. Then we have to do a lot of, uh, basically, uh, a lot of uh, approximations. Okay. Now here, uh, the both the contactors and the circuit breakers used in the capacitor switching are limited. Uh, and in the amount of energy that we can withstand. Okay, so it's very important to know this, uh, this in, the, in rush current. And this current will have, as we will see and drive, will have some high frequency compared to the system frequency. We have 50 or 60 Hertz. You will see that this in rush current coming from the capacity switching will have higher uh, frequencies uh, in the hundreds of the Hertz. And we'll see it can reach in the kilohertz. We'll see both both scenarios. And these high frequencies, these high currents, will produce high frequency voltage spikes in the in the system. And this is why we need to test 
our equipment against against switching surge. Now, in distribution system, the main factor that decide the uh, surge or the protection against uh, uh, surges is the lightning, because the switching is much less than the lightning. However, for transmission equipment, it's the opposite. The switching is more severe than than the lightning. So here, when we de-energize a capacitor, which which is uh, or we energizing that capacitor, behaves as a short circuit. We mentioned that before. Whenever I energize an unenergized or de-energized capacitor, it will first uh, change to a short circuit, and then it will be basically eventually charged. Now, the inductance in the system is the only thing that will limit the current because now at the moment of the switching, your capacitor was not, now you are collecting capacitor in the system. So originally it was not charged, then it will be like a short circuit. So what will limit the current that go through the capacitor is basically the inductance of the system, which, con which is basically the inductance of the source and the inductance of the, of the line. As I, I just hinted that these exact calculations of these currents are very difficult. Usually we use some softwares to do that. Some like EMTB, uh, ETAB, uh, sorry, uh, EMTB or EMTDC. These softwares are used to uh, simulate the transients in the power system. So if you have a realistic system, it is very hard to, uh, to find, or a big system, find the, how much surge currents, but to do manually, then you have to do certain approximations. Uh, you have to do it in a single phase. The source will modulate as a DC source, not as an AC source. The DC voltage has a magnitude equal to the peak line to neutral. So this DC voltage that we assume, it has a peak value equal to the line to neutral system voltage. And we ignore the resistance. So basically this will be our our system of switching. This is your supply. Okay, this is the voltage you supply. This is your the inductance of the system, and this is your capacitance. Now, this S you see here is the Laplace transform. So your inductor is J omega L. J omega is basically S times L. The capacitor is uh, one over J omega C or one over S C. So this S is basically your J omega. So I'm to to uh, analyze the system. I will, I need to solve second order differential equation. Okay. To avoid solving the second order differential equation, the time domain, we convert everything into using the Laplace transform, and then uh, basically we take the Laplace inverse to find the actual voltages in time and domain. Now the voltage is DC. So the Laplace of a DC is equal to, for example, if I have a DC voltage value or a step function, actually it's a step function, a step function like this, okay? It's magnitude equal to V0. So the Laplace of the step function is V0 divided by, by S. So we have a circuit here, we close the switch. We have a very simple circuit, simple KVL. Now, what is the magnitude of the voltage? We said that we will use the peak value of the single line to ground. So if it is the line to line voltage, let's say we have 13.8 kilovolt line to line, divide by root three, you will get the line to neutral. And then multiply by root two, you change the RMS value to the peak value. And that's what you use. You use the peak value as, as your V0 here to get the estimate of the current. Mm -hmm. Now, the value of the uh, C, the capacitance is, the MVR rating or the Q of the capacitors uh, over two by F times Q. From where we get this relationship, we know that Q is equal to VI sine theta. Now for the capacitor, QC is equal to V times I. Okay? Now, if I have a capacitor with ZC with I and V, we know that your I is equal to V divided by ZC. Okay? Now, ZC itself is equal to one over omega C as a magnitude, of course. So your I will equal to V over one over omega C or equal to omega C times V. This is your I. So your QC 
basically will equal to V times I or omega C times V square. So your C is equal to QC divided by omega V square and omega is your two pi F. And that's exactly what you see here, okay? Now this is a three phase, okay? And this is your line to line uh, voltage. If you have this is as a single phase, then this would be a single phase as well. And now when you do the switching, your current that is here, I of S is equal to the V, the supply, which is V zero over S divided by SLS and series with one over SC. Now, your I of S is equal to this. Now I'm like collecting terms, rearranging the equations. So we will have your I of S is equal to V zero root of C over LS omega zero over S square over omega zero square or V zero over Z zero times this. Now, what is this? Omega zero is one over root LC, which is here on over root LC. And Z zero is nothing but root of L over over C. Okay, so we have this. This is the frequency, and this is the surge impedance we, we talked about before. Okay, so this is just there's nothing here basically. I'm just collecting terms. Take V zero as a common factor to the other side, and do some mathematical manipulation, and we get up the I of S has certain constant V zero, the peak value. Divide by the surge impedance times this omega zero over s squared plus omega zero. Now, if you use the Laplace table, we know that this is the inverse of this is your sine functions. So your I of t, that is the solution for this second order difference equation, equal to v zero over z zero sine omega zero times t. So that is the frequency of the current, which will be different than the frequency of the of the supply. And then your the maximum current is the is the peak of this. Now to have a feeling about the values, let's have some numerical example to have uh, to see how much is those those numbers. Now if you have a problem about this, don't worry about this uh, about the Laplace transform. I won't ask you actually to go and derive. We will be using the last formulas only. Okay. This is uh, when we teach the course as a power system transient, we review the Laplace transform. But in this course, because this is more high voltage course than power system transients, we will not talk much about it. Okay, so let's see this example here. We have uh, a 1200 kVR. This is your QC, 4.16 kV. So this is the line to line voltage of your capacitor installed on a plant bus. The plant bus is supplied from a 5 MVA or 5,000 kVA 69 by uh, 4.16 to 2.4. So this is the line to line. This is the phase voltage. So this is a transformer, step down transformer. So the capacitor is connected at the secondary of the transformer at the line to line voltage level, having an impedance, the transformer of 7%. Now, what is this 7%? 7% is the uh, the uh, impedance of the line or the X of the line in per unit. So basically X of the transformer is equal to 0 .0, 0 0.07. Now this is in per unit. Now what is the per unit? The period equal to X T actual over X T base. And the base value we calculate that from the rating of the equipment. So the X base is nothing but the V square divided by S. And here the V square, the line to line is the 4.16 kV. And the S is basically your 5, 5 MVE. That is your base value. So if I want to find what is the actual impedance of the transformer, you multiply X base times the period value as we will see. Now we'll ignore the resistance, okay? And we'll ignore the impedance of the source. So this is the only impedance that we have in the system. What is the maximum instantaneous value uh, and the frequency of the inrush current? What is the frequency and what is the value of this inrush current? Okay. So the transformer inductive reactors, as I mentioned here, X in ohms, you multiply the pair unit 
times the base. And the base is the voltage, 4.16, because I am interested to see the impact or the value of X reflected to the, to the secondary side, divided by the 5 MVE. You, this is the resistance. This is your X, the inductance. Now, from the inductance, you can get the L, how much L in your system. So the L is coming only from the transformer. So we know that your X is equal to 2 pi F times L. So divide by 2 by F, which is here 60 hertz, you will get how much L you have in your system. Now, for the capacitor, you have seen this. Now, this is your omega. This is your voltage, basically the single line to ground. So you multiply, divide by root 3 uh, square. And you take the single phase, which is 1.2 MVR divided by 3. Now, if you have the three phase, three phase would be exactly the same for you. So that is your C. C. So I found L, I found C from, and also I can find the peak value. What is the peak value? Remember, and when you solve, we want to find the peak value of the transformer, which is root 2 times the line to line voltage divided by root 3, which is 3396 volt. From this, you can find the maximum current, which is your voltage divided by your Z. This is your Z0, which is the L over C. This is your L, and this is your C. So we'll get 1817, 1817. Very, very high current. Frequency that we will have here is 1 over root LC. It is equal to... 463 hertz. So the inrush current, which will lead also to a transient in the voltage, has basically a higher frequency than your your system. Now, this is the impact, or this method is used to if I connect one capacitor. Capacitor. What if I wanted to connect multiple capacitors? And this is practical. We usually we have multiple capacitors in parallel, so we switch them on and off based on our needs, because the consumption of the power is not constant. The reactive power consumption is not constant. So we, ju we don't just connect one capacitor. Many times we connect one capacitor, in, and then if the reactive power increases, then we connect another capacitor, a third capacitor, and so on and so forth. So we will limit the discussion if we have two capacitors. What will happen if I connect the first capacitor, which will be this very similar to what we have seen in the previous example. But the second question is, what will happen if I connect another capacitor? How this will impact the inrush current? How this will impact the frequency of this inrush current? So let's see this analysis. Okay, so we we'll start with basically, uh, we have only, uh, these are uh, open circuits. Okay, we start with L is the inductance of the source of the system. Okay, and L1 is the inductance between the two capacitors. It could be a cable or a bus between them. So that is basically uh, the uh, L1. C1 and C2 are the values of the, the capacitors. And as we mentioned in the previous example, we will ignore the, uh, the resistance. Now, ignoring the resistance is good because without the resistance, this is the worst case scenario. So the resistance will have a damping effect, will reduce the amount of surge, so we are neglecting it. So it's not that bad neglecting it because basically you are encountering the worst case scenario. Okay, so again, we'll do the same thing. We'll assume that the voltage is constant and then we will see, now here's the voltage. We are assuming that the voltage is constant also has some justification. Why? Because the transient current has a frequency, as we have seen, is much larger than the power frequency, okay? So this is very slow frequency compared to the other one. So assuming that, so for example, if this is my supply voltage like this, and here is the, the frequencies that we have. So the, the, the transients happen, you can assume that they happen across or during the voltage is almost, almost constant. And we have seen that. Now, so my current, when we switch, now I will switch on S1, it will be V, that the voltage that we, uh, will, which is the uh, root two times the line to line divided by root three, sine omega zero, and this is your Z zero. This is exactly what we have calculated before. 
we know that z0 is equal to L, this L divided by C1, and omega zero would equal to one over root LC1. Now V0 is the instantaneous voltage that we have seen before. Now assume now S2 is closed. Okay, so the system now will look like this. We have two capacitors in basically in parallel. Now, we will assume that the current that comes from the source will be ignored. Why is that? We will justify that in an example. We'll see that the currents that coming through the, the switching is much, much larger than the current coming from the supply. Okay? But we will we'll see this justification. Now we'll see what is the impact when I connect another source or another capacitor here, how this will impact my system. So now the total capacitors, assume these two are in parallel, so they are C1, C2 over C1 plus C2. As a matter of fact, those capacitors will be in series, not in parallel. Okay, those capacitors will be actually in series. So the total when we have capacitors in series, this is how we find the total the total capacitance. Now your surge impedance now has changed, it becomes L one, not L, divided by the combination or the, the the capacitors in in series, and this will be your your frequency. So we'll see. What is the impact or what is this frequency? And your current, the same thing, the V peak divided by Z0. So let's have an example, numerical example, so that we have a feeling. So we have the voltage level is 34.5 kV, a very typical primary voltage level in the distribution system. Okay. The available short circuit current is 25 kilo amp. What does this mean? Short circuit. If we have a, at this bus, if we have a symmetrical fault happened, the current capacity of the system, it can provide you around 25 kilo amps. So having the voltage, having the current, we can find this uh, impedance. So this is the only thing now will limit that current. Assume C1 is 800 MVA, R, actually, MVAR, and C2 uh, is uh, uh, 10 MVAR. Okay, the inductance between C1 and C2 is equal to 19.2 microhenry. Find both the magnitude and frequency of the inrush current after closing S1 and then S2. So I want to find the magnitude of this inrush current and its frequency when we do the closing first S1 and then S2. Now S1 is very straightforward. This is very similar to the previous example. So we will have here your uh, basically the 18, the MVR. This is your Q divided by root three times the line to line voltage. You will get the, the line current. This is your line current I. Now your XC, the reactance of the capacitor is the phase voltage divided by this current. You will get 66.13. Uh, when we divide the voltage root three, you get the phase voltage across the capacitor. And then divide by the, its current, you will get the, the reactance. Now, from this, one over omega C equal to this, I can find C1. So I found C1 now, the value of C1, 40.1 microfarad. Now, the source reactance, as, as we mentioned, the source reactance will limit the short circuit current. I know the short circuit current is 25 kilo amps. So divide the voltage, phase voltage, by the 25 kilo amps, you will find your source reactance. L, now this source reactance is equal to nothing but 2 pi, this is your X, 2 by F times L. So divide this with 2 by F, you will get your L. L is equal to 2100 micro binary. So we found L, we find C1, we are set. So your uh, I, the peak value of the current, so we take the peak voltage, this is your peak voltage, divide by root three times root two, and then you divide it by the surge impedance. So you'll get a current equal to 3.893 kilo amps. That is your inrush current that coming from the source supplying to the, to the capacitor. And the frequency is equal to one over two pi root LC is, Hertz. So that is very, very similar to the previous example.
Now, let's see what will happen in the, in the second capacitor. So this is this high frequency as before, justify the assumption of using constant voltage because the voltage of the supply will have a much, much slower signal. So we can say that during the transient, which is much faster, that the voltage stays constant. Now, that's fine. Now let's see what will happen when you close S2. Now your current I, this is your MVAR divided by root three. This is uh, 167.3. You find XC divide the phase voltage by the current, you get 119.1 ohm, uh, ohms. You find C2. So I found C1, I found C2. Then you, these two are in series. Then you will find the total C. So that is my C. Now I want to find, uh, and we know already L1 was given to us. So I will find the current. So the current is how much? 22.33 kilo amps. So let's see, see the current coming from the source was 3.89 kilo amp, much less than this current. Okay. So that is basically justify the assumption that we will ignore the current coming, coming from the source. Why? Now, now it is like almost one tenth. Okay. So the basic idea here is trying to do an assumption which make the calculation very, very easy. But on the same time, it does not jeopardize your uh, uh, your accuracy. And the frequency here, see, comes now in kilohertz. So for the second time you switch capacitor, you will have higher current and you will have also much higher frequency. Okay, so that is what I'd like to mention about switching the capacitor. High energy current, higher frequency will lead to higher voltages with higher frequency. The last thing I'd like to talk about, what will happen when we clear a pole? So that is a simple system. You have a voltage here. Okay? It has a resistance inductance. This is the capacitance of, of, the, uh, of the system, of the, of, of, the, of the cable, could be, or overhead lines. Okay? You have a breaker that is normally closed. Okay? And this is the voltage across the, uh, the breaker. It's a short circuit. Then a fault happened. So a fault happened, what you want to do, you want to open this breaker and to clear the fault. So this is the red line, basically, is your IS, the rated current. So we have a normal current here. And then at this moment, we have a fault happened. The, when the fault happened, the current jumps to very, very high values. Okay. Now, the breaker is basically closed. Now the breaker will start to open. It will take some time before it starts to react to clear this fault current. And US is zero because it was closed. Now we open. Now once it opens, you will have some arcing because you have to know this. As we open the breaker, the distance starts zero between the two poles of the breaker. But as we start to move, it's still very small. One is now energized, one is not energized. So you will have ionization, you will have an arc between the, the two, basically, the two sides or the two, the two moving uh, contacts of your, uh, of your uh, breaker. So the voltage here will not be zero. It will be the, uh, the uh, resistance times the current, the resistance of the arc, small values, but still there. Now, by elongation more, still the fault not yet cleared. So this is the fault current is there. And you see here the blue, the, sorry, the green line, still we have a voltage here until it is completely cleared. The moment it's cleared here, we have what we call transient recovery voltage. When the fault completely cleared here, because now you have no current at all, and the voltage now is restored. It doesn't restore smoothly. There will be some transient here. And these transient will have a frequency which is equal to one over two pi root of LC. Okay? And this again, L and C is your C of the system and L of your, your system. Okay? So this transient or TRV voltage is a phenomenon happens across the circuit breaker that when we open, we open the port. 
So that is the second type of switching when we have a opening transient. So in the when we have the capacitor bank, we have a closing transient. Now we will have an opening transient that happened. Now L is the inductance of the supply. C is the stray capacitance. That's not a regular capacitor. That is the stray capacitance of the of the system. Now with the breaker opens, now we understand this, trying to interrupt the current, the arc forms between its contacts. Now the interruptions occur when the current pass through the zero. Now always the, the interruption happens when the current reaches to the zero. When that comes, the current reaches to the zero here. That is the moment because there's no current. And because remember, this is an AC. Okay? So this is the moment that basically most likely the breaker will, will interrupt. Now at that zero, the voltage is maximum at this point. Okay? So the C will remain discharged because of the short circuit. We have a short circuit here. So this three capacitance will be uh, discharged and C will start to, ch uh, to charge through L once the short circuit is completely removed from the system. Graphically, so this is my current, this is my voltage, and this is my TRV. This is a simulation. I think, no, this is actually a major, actual measurement happened in the, uh, in one of the systems taken a long time ago in 1999. So this is a TRV example that you will have. So the, when the current reaches the, to the zero here, you will have this transient and then the voltage. This is the voltage across the, 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 the circuit breaker. Okay, so how the voltage look like here? It, this is how it look like now. Okay, so this is the system voltage. This is the fault uh, current, and this is the TRV voltage across your across your uh, breaker. Now, if the rate of the voltage build up, you see here the voltage build up here is higher than the rate of the dielectric st strength build up between the breaker. The breaker will not be able to hold up the voltage and will reignition of the fault. Okay. And you have to wait until a uh, second half cycle when the current goes to the zero crossing to see if it is possible for the for the breaker to clear the clear the fault. So that is give you uh, an overview about the uh, actually the TRV, how it is actually uh, generated, and how basically it can impact the reignition of the of the fault current. Now, this is an appendix. Uh, I just uh, left it for you. Uh, this appendix will basically derive the formula for this. How we get this sinusoidal? Uh, there is uh, basically uh, uh, using detailed uh, the class. Uh, and so if you are not really interested to it, this is not required. As I mentioned, I, I need to show you the simple Laplace. This is much harder Laplace here. So all the basically all the uh, derivation here you can see here starting from uh, when you when we start here with when we have uh, the fault we have an uh, lc with a sub supply now the supply is a sinusoidal here okay so we apply kvl with so the voltage vl plus vc equal to the source vl is ldi by dt and this is equal to VC, your I equal to CD, VC by DT. Substitute, you will get this second order differential equation. This is your omega square, which is one uh, over LC, but omega is equal to one over root LC. Then you take the Laplace of the whole. Group. Now we can solve it here, but this is much harder to solve differential equation in the time domain. We take the Laplace, assuming initial conditions equal to zero, then you will get up such uh, a formula. As I said, a much more complicated formula. And then you will end up having a two cosine functions here, one with the regular frequency, one with the transient frequency. And then approximately you will come up at the end with this voltage that approximate this type of transient. Here is your omega zero. But omega zero is dictated by the inductance and the capacitance of your system. As I said, this is just an appendix. So if you are really interested in it, you can go through it. If not, you can just skip this. This is just to give you some uh, background about, about this important uh, topic. 